Is it possible to get to in our 80s, mid 90s and feel just as sharp cognitively as we are in our 30s, 40s and 50s? Oh, by all means. I'm going to jump in and say yes. That's not just an opinion and we have tremendous evidence for that. A healthy lifestyle can definitely provide instances for the brain and for the body to repair itself and to function at its peak. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Howdy friends, great to be here with you. I hope that you've been keeping well. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate science degree and a master's in the science of human nutrition. In today's episode, we welcome back neurologists Dr. Zaisha and Dean Sherzai. In previous episodes together, we focus mostly on food and neurodegenerative disease. What foods and dietary patterns are helpful when it comes to healthy aging of the nervous system? We also dedicated an entire episode to omega-3s and brain health. Today, however, we took a turn down a different yet equally important road, and that is exercise. How exactly does exercise impact brain physiology. The shares I share information about processes like angiogenesis, increased levels of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and reduced inflammation. We also look at this story through an evolutionary lens, something I think is really fascinating to think about. What part of our cognition does exercise affect most? Attention, memory, processing speed, etc. How much and what type of exercise is recommended? Can exercise help reverse mild cognitive impairment? and much more. I love these guys, and if you don't already, I'm sure in a few short hours, you will too. Please enjoy. This is me and Dr. Zaisha and Dean Sherzai. Aisha, Dean, welcome back, my friends. It's great to have you back on the show. It's wonderful to be back. Um, we, You're like family. We, we've connected several times, and every time it's such a organic and and warm and and most importantly meaningful conversation so we really Mm. love speaking with you it's so good to see you again simon yeah it is and those uh feelings are are mutual i've really loved getting to know you guys and and the kids of course too uh maybe we we start here i think this is the fourth no this must be the fifth or the sixth time you've been on the show i've lost track there but there's a bunch of, of really detailed episodes in the archives uh, that people can can go back to. Um, but maybe we, we start just by getting a little bit up to date. I know that there's, there's a bit that's been happening in, in your life. I know this week um, there's a new member of your family. It's a, it's a beautiful story. Can you share that story with us? Yes, absolutely. I think I'm being very chatty about it. I think Dean should tell you himself because he was the person who did it. But um, we just added a new family member, a sweet dog. Her name is Hope. Um, So Dean was driving on a very busy highway last week and uh, you saw saw a little dog cross the court? It was uh, 495. I was taking the kids to school and packed highway. I mean, uh, we're talking about multiple lanes. And then I see this little dog trying to cross, but there's a, um, you know, block so they can't cross the road. And uh, he, uh, she swerved and um, avoided one car and another car almost hit it. Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. just, you know, got to the side of the road and just, you know, huddled down and, and, and fear and trembling. And so what I did was I just went to the side of the road, stopped the car. I, I'm, I'm a little bit of a pushy person. I, I got some cars around to stop the traffic. And then I got one car to stay to the right so they can come around. And and uh, an amazing truck driver actually came right behind me. The dog ra- ran under the truck. I distracted the dog and he just went from the top because it didn't have the load. So there was a space. Went that mm-hmm. and just picked, him, picked her up and handed her to Gosh. me. I took her, thanked them, and we all went our way. And I took her to the shelter where we were going to pick up Obi, our other dog. uh, Because she was getting some medical treatment. And they said, we have to take her to LA, you know, the central shelter in LA. 
And because that's the protocol, we took her to the shelter and they, they said, we have to keep her for a week to make sure that she has all the, you know, injections and everything Vaccination else. Vaccinations are taken care of. Her. Um, when we called mm-hmm. back, we said, we want her. If nobody else claims her, they said, you have to wait for a week. Um, and then we found out that this poor dog had rotten teeth, all of them. So they have to be extracted. We, we, we did a cleaning, but we haven't extracted any teeth. She had two broken ribs. Paws were injured, and I think she was being used in a puppy mill. I don't know how they would know this. The doctor said that uh, yeah. she has she had several babies, and and now um, was just in, um, mm. completely, I mean, emaciated and 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 f- afraid mm. for her life. So yesterday we called. Nobody had picked her up, and we went and picked her up, and and it was just yeah. amazing. She's um, adorable. Mm. adorable. We brought her home. Well, yeah, the. Uh, from from the looks of the videos, um, she looks to be a, a very beautiful soul. She really is. Um, yeah. She's already brought so much joy. We were afraid that she might have been, you know, very scared and afraid, and she might uh, <coughs> reflect that in her behavior. But it's unbelievable. Um, a little hug and a little a bit of affection brought the best out in her, and now mm. she's getting along with everyone, and we're so so happy to have her with us. How does she go getting on with Obi? Have have they have they been sort of spending time together yet? There were moments of jealousy at the very beginning <laughs> where Obi just kind of stared at her and then stared at us to say, like, really? You're giving her my favorite spot on the couch? But mm-hmm. overall, she's he's being a very, very good big brother and very kind and considerate, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. sharing her snacks and her space with her. It's so wonderful to see that. Yeah, we, we expected mm-hmm. her to be a little bit more, although Obi is not that aggressive. No, he's such but, a gentle soul. Yeah, but we expected a little more uh, territorial behavior. There was none. There's yeah. absolutely none. So it's a lot of affection. So we we're, we're kind of happy because he was the same. He was a rescue. Mm-hmm. He was a, right. actually he was in bad, worse shape. Yes, he was. Whereas um, mm-hmm. Hope, I mean, within a week, actually a couple of days in, in the house, she's actually adapted. Yeah. It took Obi literally six months to 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 adapt to the house and and taking her out taking him out was horrible. Yeah. It took 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 him some time to get out of his shell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Adopting a, a dog can be an incredible gift. Not not just to the dog, but to those that actually have the opportunity to do it. When, when I was growing up, our family dog, we adopted um, Jake and I've got so many wonderful memories with him. I couldn't agree more. It's Absolutely. such a beautiful gift for, for all of us and we're, we're really lucky to have her. Today we're, we're really wanting to kind of drill down on the effect of exercise on brain health, on, on cognition and we hear a lot about the benefits of exercise for heart health. I think everyone has probably heard that at some stage, but it's what's often less spoken about is how moving our body on a regular basis can affect our cognition, our ability to remember things or to make a decision. So there's a couple of questions I want to throw out here that I think can can kind of frame this conversation. And the first is the rather obvious question of what do we understand about the relationship between exercise and and cognition? And then the second is if we look through an evolutionary lens, how how might we sort of explain this relationship between exercise and and cognition? But before I get you to dive into these, I think it could be a good idea to define exercise, what this is and is not – and, and also cognition, just so that we're all on the, the same page. Absolutely. <clears throat> so what makes us unique, not singularly unique, but exponentially better than primates, let's say, is cognition. Cognition has many stages, but it by in general, it means ability to gather information, process it, and plan with it. I mean, there are many, many different ways you can define it, but that's basically it with the planning component being a a predominant component. I mean, we're not the only species that does this. There are a lot of animals that do it, a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, including primates and dolphins and lots of animals that do this, this, but we do it really well because that planning component takes place in the frontal lobe, which is uniquely large for humans. Not large so much by volume, but by neurons and connectivity. 
So that's the newest member in our brain. And that's the part that actually gives you one of the cognitive domains, which is processing, you know, problem solving, making lists and prioritizing. And also, here's the thing, negating, saying no. Mm. Not a no in the human sense, but no in the off on kind of a way. So it's, it's a very unique part of the brain that lets you plan, prioritize, and negate so that all that's left is the direction to take. So it's, 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 a, it's a very unique thing. The other aspects of cognition are visual spatial, attention, memory, processing speed, the speed component we'll talk about, which, which comes when you talk about tra traumatic brain injury, we'll, we'll discuss that a little more, and language. Those are the main six domains of cognition. Some people actually also add coordination and a movement but uh, but that's that that works a little outside. That's basically human cognition um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and its totality. Now, the part that's that's important in this con concept is how does exercise affect it? But first we, like you said, we have to define what exercise is. The same way, exercise can be defined very loosely, movement, you know, or the, and another way you can on the other end of the spectrum is, very regimented, you know, certain protocols, certain uh, exercise routines, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Or in a more common way, exercise is when you are pushing your body to the point beyond its normal state of existence, where you actually, so and mm -hmm. this is a unique human endeavor, because usually we don't call it exercise. We move, we run, you know, and so on and so forth. Right. When we push ourselves on a regular basis beyond our normal ambulation, movement, that's exercise. So that means that both as far as uh, respiration and and uh, and um, a movement is concerned, both duration and intensity, which is aerobic and anaerobic, and as far as muscle strength is concerned. that's a, So I'm separating aerobic and anaerobic a little bit from this. Aerobic and anaerobic is often misclassified. They, they talk about weight training as if it's anaerobic. Well, it is, yes but you can have anaerobic and you know exercise like running if it's a short burst of running really fast it's anaerobic yeah so it's a matter of oxygen usage or not exercise is when you're pushing your body beyond the normal state on a regular basis mm -hmm. that's a new term concept for humans but that's important because as a quick we'll get to it much more those two between exercise on a regular basis and brain health has been found to be an incredible relationship, an incredible relationship. There's an evolutionary aspect to it mm -hmm. that 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 is profoundly important that we we really don't talk about it. We talk about it as if exercise is just as important for the heart. I'll get I'll tell you this this might make our cardiologists in the audience not too happy or the nephrologist. Exercise is exponentially more important for the brain than any other organ. Yeah. And we'll talk about why that is. Okay. So with these definitions in mind, let's start with that, the first question that, that I kind of wanted to frame this conversation with. So what do we understand about the relationship between exercise and various domains of cognition? Do we have different studies that have looked at people who exercise less or more or particular types of exercise and some sort of association between that and cognition? Absolutely. Yes. So there has been several studies and several meta-analyses and systematic reviews actually that have looked at specific types of exercise and then combination of different exercises and its effect on global cognitive outcomes, which means, you know, general memory and cognition scores and specific uh, aspects of cognition as well, like attention or language or processing speed. Overall, the results show that people who um, essentially uh, conduct a regimented exercise program, whether it's twice a week or three times a week, but regimented is the specific aspect of it that is important, which means there has to be continuity in that action. They tend to do very well as far as their global cognitive scores are concerned, which means they have better functioning brain. They process information faster. They remember things better. They actually have better visual spatial um, uh, functions as well. Now, as far 
far as specific types of exercises are concerned, it just depends on the different type of population, their age, and some confounding factors, you know, such as uh, cognitive reserve, how educated or how, you know, cognitively active they were, etc. But it seems that a combination of both aerobic and strength training exercises tends to be very, very favorable as far as global cognitive function is concerned. And, and as far as specifics, like Aisha said beautifully, um, the, the areas that seem to be affected most powerfully is focus and executive function. Mm -hmm. Now, the, all of the global uh, cognitive elements are affected. We know that all of them are affected to some, but the parts that are affected profoundly, almost like magically are, uh, I, I hate to use that term, but exponentially, let's say, let's not, not call it magic, mm -hmm. is attention and executive function. And executive function is, like I said, processing, uh, problem solving, and things of that nature. And those two are repeatedly, have been repeatedly been shown to be affected positively. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and you see these effects in both, you know, healthy individuals who don't have any baseline cognitive impairment, you see it in people who have very mild cognitive impairment. And there have been a mm -hmm. lot of studies that have actually shown this effect of improvement in uh, global cognitive uh, scores, even in people who have some level of neurodegenerative mm -hmm. diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it's wonderful to see that uniform effect of exercise in multiple different categories of cognition. Question I've never asked you guys, but I think is interesting is how do you kind of pass out or separate just say normal aging of the brain versus pathological aging? And I'm not even sure if that's something that is is thought of um, and is such a thing. And, and when we're talking about exercise here, are we talking about exercise slowing down cognitive decline or aging or can it actually be something that let's say you're healthy and you're in your 30s and 40s is there immediate benefits up for grabs where you know, exercise could actually improve your iq or uh, improve your function at work um if it was something that you kind of added into your routine amazing no that's a beautiful that's question, a great question. Uh, absolutely i mean so uh, let's talk about that that's a, actually one of the first times anybody's asked us that question and i always craved because the delineation of what's disease and what's aging or what's cumulative trauma over life those three things right uh, aging mm -hmm. cumulative trauma uh, throughout life and disease huntington's is a disease because there's a chromosome 4 that's gone abnormal and that creates this repeat CAGs, which creates a toxic process in the brain that in their thirties, no matter what the person does, it's going to damage the, the brain, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, you can do some things to affect it a bit, but the, 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 the lesion that's left behind is, is, can't be affected through lifestyle and things of that nature. And there are genetically what they call high prev high penetrance diseases like that as well, even in frontotemporal lobe dementia. There's a small group of, a large group of people who have genetic disease that no matter what you do, they're gonna get the disease. In Alzheimer's, that accounts for 3% of all Alzheimer's, meaning that no matter what you do, this 3% will get the disease. That's a lesional disease, right? For the rest of the diseases of aging, it seems to be cumulative trauma. This is such a beautiful, empowering statement. Because if we think that we, we talked about 90% of Alzheimer's can be prevented, but it came from this. We always say where there's data, we say there's data, but this was extrapolation, but it was a meaningful extrapolation. Most of the rest of the Alzheimer's, the other 97%, we went with 90%, is a combination of genes and environment. And the genes have to do with body's response to lifestyle, to, 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 to environment. If you have bad genes for fat metabolism, even a little bit of fat is going to damage you. But if you have good genes like APOE2, even you can eat more fat and even saturated fat and your body can clean it up and get rid of it. There are genes for getting rid of waste, waste, waste disposal, you know, exocytosis of cells. And if you have good genes that can do that really well, you can withstand a lot. You know, you've heard this, we've heard this. And somebody, whenever you do a talk, somebody says, oh, don't worry about lifestyle. My uncle lived to 95 and he smoked and drank. And, well, you know, your uncle, first of all, I'm not sure about the data there, but, but most likely was one of those offliers that had great genes mm. across the board. 
the, the other 95% of population in the middle of the bell curve don't have those genes. So most of aging is has to do with our body responding to the traumas of life. You know, the vascular traumas, the degenerative traumas, the, the bad food, the stress, this lack of sleep, all of these things. Sleep is a thing that gets rid of waste. If you're not getting good sleep, you're not cleaning up the brain. So it's going to damage day by day by day. So that's the beautiful part of that statement, that question that you just asked. For a lot of us, it's a cumulative nature. Now, when you're younger, it's the other end. So <laughs> this is, so when you're pre-birth, the brain is developing, right? We're doubling neurons. Then first five years of now life, massive neuronal development, neurons growing, and then the connections to some extent. Okay. In fact, there's a part around age three to four where there's cell death, it's called apoptosis. The brain actually shrinks and that leaves the final infrastructure. Even there, lifestyle matters because if you have bad food, it's gonna interfere with that growth. If you have stress during those years, we know this for, from data, mm -hmm. even during those first five years, it actually will interfere with that developmental mm -hmm. stage. If you have lack of sleep, 12 hours of sleep is what's needed. It's gonna interfere with that development. So in both of those, lifestyle and, and food and mm -hmm. exercise and movement and, and stress and all of that matters. One is during development and how it develops. And if you give it the right amount of stimulus, the brain develops and focus develops. And if you give it too much focus, uh, too much stress and too much anxiety or too much stimulus, mm -hmm. the focus centers are actually developed in a bad way for the rest of your life. So now you have attention problems. So you're, you, that was a very poignant question. You can affect your brain development at any stage from birth all the way to death. Just to clarify, the 12 hours sleep that you mentioned. For kids. What? That was for kids. For kids. Um, yes. so, so, so adults <laughs> listening. Like, um, <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's, it's not an excuse to sleep 12 hours. No, no. For us, um, seven to eight hours for us. Yeah. Life. The... The that point about outliers is is a great one that often does come up, and I like to remind people that just because it's possible doesn't mean it's probable. Right. So I'm not sure that we should kind of bet on having um, incredible genes that make us an outlier. We should probably assume that we have crummy genes and and do what we can. Absolutely. Um, so with all of that in mind, is it possible to get to say? in our 80s, mid 90s, and feel just as sharp cognitively as we are in our 30s, 40s, and 50s? Oh, by all means. I'm, I'm going to jump in and say yes. Um, and that's not just an opinion, and we have tremendous evidence for that, um, both you know from mechanistic studies and from population studies and different lines of research showing that when people adopt a healthy lifestyle, which, you know, by definition, I mean, there is, it's a variation of the same theme, but a healthy lifestyle can definitely provide, you know, instances for the brain and for the body to repair itself and to function at its peak. Um, and mm -hmm. obviously it's not, you know, a superfood that does that. It's not a specific kind of uh, regimented, you know, eating pattern that does that. It's a comprehensive and a multifaceted approach to lifestyle, which includes exercise and movement and nutrition and stress management and sleep can sound overwhelming, but if all of it is done in a systematic way, absolutely the body can flourish and repair itself. Tell, um, um, Dr. Wareham. We have examples of such individuals. I mean, we've been really, um, <clears throat> we've been lucky that we worked, uh, you know, at Loma Linda um, and uh, Loma Linda is a blue zone as, you know, mm -hmm. Simon, we've talked about that in the past. And, you know, there are individuals who um, are in their 80s, 90s, even in their 100s, and they're thriving, you know, and when you look mm -hmm. at their lifestyle, it's indicative of what a healthy lifestyle can do. I mean, Dr. Wareham mm -hmm. was a surgeon in Loma Linda, and he was doing open to close surgeries till age 95, Five, yeah. right? Yeah. And after age 95, right. he decided to retire because he wanted to travel. And, mm -hmm. you know, after a very short period of illness, um, he passed away on his own terms at the age of 104, Four. Four. Yeah. Yeah, 104, 105. And we have examples of that. 
uh, many examples of that too. So yes, mm. it is quite possible. I'd love to, I'd love to see some more data, and I'm sure it's coming from AHS two, or I think there's an AHS three cohort. Yes. Um, looking at neurodegenerative disease because I think from from memory I've only seen it in the AHS one cohort. Mm-hmm. Um, have you heard any any plans for for the the kind of researchers looking at those, those cohorts to investigate the incidence of um, neurodegenerative diseases within that population? We, we did a paper we uh, on um, uh, Evans Health Study, a subcohort called the Religious Order Study, which was 500 people uh, who did uh, really robust neurocognitive testing it's called California Verbal Learning, CVLT, very robust cognitive test. Um, a lot of times when you see these studies, and you look at their cognitive testing, it's not, it's like one little clock drawing or something. No, this was a really robust clock, a cognitive testing, 500 people. There's an abstract, if people look at the abstract, um, it hasn't been published, but it's an abstract. It's, it was, uh, and we saw um, uh, cognition across um, the uh, nutrition from vegan, uh, um, uh, vegetarian, pescatarian, and omnivore. So across those domains, just like that, Across those lifestyles, you saw the ones that ate more plants had better cognition than those who had less and so on and so forth. So there's already some data, an abstract that actually demonstrated that. And we're hoping that there will be more of this as well. Um, and, and then when you look at other studies, like Aisha was the lead in, in the California teacher study, which is the largest, 133,000 people, mm-hmm. and you found amazing stuff. Yeah, absolutely. As far as longevity is concerned, I mean, there's a there's a direct association between a healthy lifestyle, which includes movement and exercise, and longevity in the California teacher study, as well as the Northern Manhattan study in New York at Columbia University, where my mentors conducted the research. So. It, 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 it's, it's a pretty, uh, you know, um, solid statement to say that uh, movement and exercise and a healthy lifestyle leads to longevity um, and not just longevity, but um, very active years later on as well. Because, you know, one right. could live yeah. a long life, but if you're not moving and if you're in a state of disease, that's probably not helpful. No, mm-hmm. no, we want to kind of have an increase in in years high quality years and yes. and not be frail but still enjoying our time i think that's i think we're all on the same page there Absolutely. so coming back to exercise i think this idea that our brains may have developed these various cognitive domains in response to exercise at least as one sort of stimulus i think this idea is super fascinating and and deserves some unpacking so Perhaps you could walk us through the the evolutionary relationship between exercise and brain health. Yeah, this is, uh, I, I love this topic, but I want to make sure that I don't get too convoluted. I, I always mm. worry about getting too convoluted. But, the, you know, so let's talk about the neurotransmitter that everybody's heard about, dopamine. And mm. everybody knows about it because of its effect on motivation and, and effect on on uh, uh, getting um, uh, people to do things, right? So, um, but the other part that they most people don't know is that's actually directly connected to movement. It's the main neurotransmitter for movement. Is I mean, that's why when people who have Parkinson's, their dopamine centers are affected first. And right. more than anything else, their movement is affected. But along the way, their motivation is affected as well. Their, their ability to want, their ability to create landmarks. Um, and this is manifest in really unique ways. You put a line in front of somebody with Parkinson's, they, they have difficulty moving past that line. And that's, that's actually has to do with this emotion of doing something, right? This motivation, motive force. So the two are connected. At the very evolutionary level, movement and motivation are connected at the dopamine, at the neurotransmitter level. It doesn't get more fundamental level than that. So movement was coded into our very existence, along with our emotions. Yes, we're emotionally unique. All animals have emotions. Therefore, that's what makes us unique as, as, as a group of species, let's say. But, but we're also connected to movement. Now that's two directional. When you move, you affect your emotions. When you have certain emotional variables, it affects your movement. So, 
Forget about the second one. The first one, which is when you move, it affects your emotions. When you influence your movement, be it toward a goal or by just pushing yourself beyond a particular goal, that creates both a sense of success, which creates this long-term effect of mood, and it actually creates a, a euphoric process. So that's why study after study has shown that there's nothing more effective on your moods, even more than any antidepressants, than exercise. Because it right. fundamentally, at the molecular level, affects your mood systems through dopamine, mm -hmm. through endorphins, through everything else. So this, I want people, people have heard different versions of this, but our movement are literally the best antidepressants, the best anti-anxiety med medications you have in your system. By creating a goal and surpassing it, especially through movement, you actually affect your serotonin and your dopamine systems that are the foundations of your mood, which is remarkable. We, we, and, and we, never, we never hear this in, 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 in uh, gatherings and in, in conferences that there is such a strong relationship to, your, to controlling your mood systems. They, they, they speak of it in passing, but they never speak of it as a treatment. They never speak of it as a dose response phenomenon, literally dose response. We do all these studies of drugs and dose response. Well, at this dose, it does this. At this dose, it does this. Well, we have powerful data that exercise, its effect as a dose response is more powerful than any drug. What do you think about, it, if we kind of just try and connect this, I've read a few different sort of ideas of, of this evolutionary kind of relationship, but what I'm hearing from you is that dopamine in, in some ways is telling you that you're on the right path to to keep to persevere with an activity or a movement that you're doing. Does, does that sound right? Correct. Correct. Absolutely. It, it, there, there is no, uh, not to not make sure that I, we don't overstate it, dopamine doesn't have its own thought process. We give it the direction. But if, right. if it's in agreement with that direction, it's that's the motivation and, and movement. It's, it's directly mm -hmm. connected to it. And so thinking back to our ancestors and their movement from, from, my, from, a, from a, a lot of what I've read on this relationship, it talks about foraging and foraging being a kind of aerobic exercise. And so where my mind's going here is that in, in this instance, those that were foraging, dopamine, is potentially telling them that they're on the right track and um, leading to perseverance and then, you know, greater success with foraging and ultimately greater survival. Is that something that you've read about or thought about? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, um, the, the, the movement component of what makes us unique, the reason, what makes us unique is the fact that we can actually search and, and find the thing that makes us survive. What are those two things? Reproduction and, and food, right? So for both of those, hopefully we need to move. Um, well, maybe somebody like you don't have to move too much. You're a good looking guy. But, but for most of the men, they have to move. And, and they have to move for reproduction. They have to move for foraging. And the foraging component, those little successes are the dopamine burst. And now let's imagine, you beautifully organized. It, let's imagine there's a genetic person, genetically designed, that doesn't have as strong of a motive mechanism in them. It's, they're moving and their dopamine system is not stimulated as much. So they're not as moving as much as the next person. Well, they're going to die mm -hmm. and they're, those genes, right. their weaker genes dies with them. But there's next to them, there's another person that has the genetics where the dopamine is stronger. The relationship between dopamine and movement for foraging is stronger. Guess what? They're going to survive. So that's why we became more, and, and the part that actually is, makes us unique from monkeys and everything, because we think, now here's the thinking part is actually connected to that. You think, you move, you succeed, that's a much higher level. That's why our thinking was developed in conjunction with movement and, and reward. Right. So, we, you know, people talk today about the runner's high. So, but physiologically, I guess, uh, you know, our, our body just 
reacts to to movement um, and we've been I guess you know affected by millions of years of evolution so when we go for a run uh, is that's that's a kind of signal to the body that we're we're doing something that's going to increase our chance of survival we're out there looking for calories for example mm -hmm. and that these changes in in brain chemistry are helping us stick to that path is that would that be a fair thing to say i think so i think that would be a fair thing to say and i think variations of that are seen in other activities too um, anything that raises our heart rate and moves our body whether it's running or dancing and mm -hmm. no threat being at the end of that activity it creates an incredibly positive and almost a cheerful sense of well-being um, mm -hmm. you know obviously when we run the act of running or moving fast was initiated because there was a threat but nowadays you know no threat being there but us taking part in that action creates the positive uh, environment for the brain. The one thing that is not usually talked about, you know, whenever, whenever someone talks about the runner's high or that beneficial aspect of exercise for the brain, we talk about the creation of endorphins and the release of brain derived neurotrophic factor and, you know, a connection of the neurons and creating the creation of more connections. But the one thing that kind of gets skipped, in my opinion, being a vascular neurologist is the cerebral blood flow. The brain actually gets a massive dose of oxygen, something that it craves all the time with running and with aerobic activity. And that oxygen and that creation of that environment where the brain is getting so much cerebral blood flow in itself creates that positive mood and that runner's high. So in, in mm -hmm. many ways, it's, it's a beautiful thing that happens. Beautifully stated. I mean, there you can see there are so many variables that exercise affects in the brain. Aisha brought up the dance thing. Yeah. So there's the positive foraging component that you brought in. The negative part is, so we either had to go find something or run away from something. Right. When your heart beats fast, it actually tells you primordially that there, there's a history of threat to that. So even if it's artificially raised high, you, that's why anxiety is connected to that as well. Sometimes, even if you, somebody who has a tendency for anxiety, if you artificially raise their heart rate, all of the anxiety phenomena come with it. So this phenomenon of getting movement going, yet the threat being averted, the threat not being there actually creates the high. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Not just exercise, I should have said it, dancing. Why do we dance? Well, some of us dance poorly, but why do we dance? We dance because it creates that sense of anxiety, of threat averted. Yeah. That, that, that rush of being uh, running, moving towards away from something, but yet no threat. And we see these in animals, in meerkats. Meerkats are very, very interesting part. Laughter is connected to this. These meerkats, they look up from their holes to see for e look for eagles. And when there's a threat, there's a, a particular sound. When the threat goes away, they actually create another sound that sounds like laughter. Laughter, the first human laughter, the first human sense of joy is that threat averted. That's why movement is so intrinsically connected to our emotions again. Mm. And, and on the contrary, if, you know, why do we take beta blockers when we're anxious, that artificial way of reducing heart rate kind of tells us that there is no threat. It takes away, right. it takes away that anxiety. So that's actually a really good contrast Beautiful. to the creation of increased heart rate during exercise. And to add to that, why is it that exercise is beneficial for anxiety? Because you're moving your heart rate to that level that you usually feel in anxiety, but yet you're not feeling threat. In fact, you're feeling success. Mm -hmm. So you're artificially mitigating, allaying the anxiety mm -hmm. sensation. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, we're, we're, the two of us are now like just going into this no, because it's that important. I've, that's, that. I've got a couple of questions there. So um, the first one is how, how, how much of this is, is a adaptation to change in heart rate 
versus actual movement itself. So, for, so let's say, for example, I'm listening in and I'm, I'm thinking, oh, well, I can get my heart rate up to a kind of moderate, to equi- equivalent to a moderate uh, intensity activity by sitting in a sauna. Um, is that going to have the same potential effects on on cognition? Hmm. No, there's there's so much more to movement because you get blood flow. It's not just heart beating fast. It's also endorphins being released. And so so the heart beating fast does some of the work, but it's not just enough. That's just hmm. that's not enough. It's the muscle squeezing. It's so when you're getting your heart rate being be, beating fast. It's because of your body sympathetic phenomenon, the, the, the vagus nerve being inhibited. So the heartbeat starts beating fast, but none of the other stuff, such as the fact that the biggest pump in your body is your legs. Mm-hmm. So the veins in your legs have a unit, one directional valves. They don't squeeze the muscles in your legs, squeeze the veins, push the blood up. So if somebody is exercising, they're pushing the muscles, they're pushing the blood up. So it's not just the heart being sped up. It's true blood volume being increased into the brain, true blood mm-hmm. oxygenation going through the lungs increasing. Right. Plus the fact that you, by, by, by making those, by, by making that exercise movement, you're also increasing these um, uh, chemical reactions. Insulin resistance is affected. We know this short-term and long-term insulin resistance is affected. Plus what's happening in your brain it's, it's so much more than just artificially raising heart rate. It's profoundly more. And if we continue this thought through this evolutionary lens, I'm, I'm curious as to what we're doing with our mind during exercise, how important that is. So if we think about foraging, for example, and, and the adaptations, we, we might go into some of those mechanisms a little bit more uh, with regards to kind of what's happening. But if we just think about foraging and the, the adaptations that uh, we are hypothesizing occurred as a result of that. Foraging would, I assume, require great memory. Where are you in your environment? You're going back to areas where maybe you found food before. You might be looking for certain clues. Um, you have to think about predation. Um, you need to use fine motor skills to kind of pick berries or dig things up. Um, so you're, you're not just exercising, you're out there moving your body, but you're using your mind at the same time. So I'm curious when we think about movement today and its effect on, on cognition, is there a benefit to layering on some sort of cognitively demanding sort of task on top of exercise or is you know, I'm looking at, I've got a stationary bike outside, is sitting on that and listening to music for, for 60 minutes, is that going to be enough? So the, the point that you bring up about thinking while foraging, movement, thought, processing, planning, that's such an important point. Uh, we, we, we didn't just go out there and blindly just jump and, and, and start foraging. We always used our frontal lobe, but we always used our processing part of the brain. And that's, that's why it's also connected to thinking. When, when you exercise, it affects your thinking in both directions. When you, when you exercise and think, there are actually studies that show that when people are on a stationary bike and they have to do some processing or problem solving or memorizing, they actually do better, ironically. Of wow. course, you don't want to get too complicated, but they've, they've shown multiple studies that when they do two tasks, it increases cognition. But at the same time, the other way around that when you when you actually think and exercise, it affects it affects your exercise quality. It affects your motivational centers. We're talking about the dopamine and its response, and and all of that is affected because the combination of the motivational centers, the dopamine and the substantia nigra. I'm not going to name all those those mechanisms, as well as movement as well as thinking are intertwined for, for millennia in humans. And that's what makes it so important. It's not just an act of raising the heart rate up. It's right. the act right. of raising the heart rate, getting the muscles moving, getting the thinking process going, getting the focus. When you're foraging, you still, for most of our existence, we had to look for predators. We, mm-hmm. we, we were not the predator. We were not the main predator. 
always, it's a discerning phenomenon. Right. Discern, the number one variable that our survival defend, depended on was discernment. Discerning between if that's a tree or a lion, or you know, that discernment is at the corner, at the center of our existence, at the center of our understanding mind, our sympathetic, parasympathetic system is operating on that level, which is very primal uh, emotional systems. But even our cognitive system, no matter how smart we get as species, we're still driven by those primal discernment tools. Mm -hmm. So if these are not disconnected phenomena, when you exercise, you affect thinking, you affect right. processing, you affect processing speed, how quickly you can process. We know people who exercise, even independent of pushing their brain, their processing speed also gets faster. Right. Their focus gets better. Their attention and, and memory gets better. And not as a separate phenomenon, as a consequence of exercise directly, because all of our existence depended on these three phenomena working together. The dopamine motivational movement, the, the, the movement phenomenon itself, and the thinking, discernment, problem solving, memorizing, you know, all of that as well. It's a, it's, it's a, a incredible tool we can use to build cognition. It, it bewilders me these schools that actually close exercise programs and, in, 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 you know, and, and they think that they're gaining something. We're not, we're losing tremendous amount of capacity. But when you have kids exercise, especially early in the day, their focus gets better significantly. P patients with attention deficit dis disorders, when they exercise in the morning, their attention gets profoundly better. Imagine young men who are supposed to be, you know, foraging and, 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 and out there running, you're holding them in a classroom, a prisoner for, with 30 other people listening, and, and you expect them to maintain focus and attention mm. and memory and cognition for eight hours. It's not even evolutionarily, scientifically sound. So that's why movement is so profoundly important for thinking. Yeah, I wanted to to ask you about exercise early in the morning. I know uh, Robin Sharma says early morning activity will activate a pharmacy of mastery. And I, I was interested if <laughs> I there love was that. anything in that which you've just kind of spoken to. But if we if we kind of just think a little bit further here with regards to uh, some of these underlying processes that happen when we exercise that could be affecting these different cognitive domains. And uh, Aisha, you mentioned BDNF and angiogenesis and, and other things before. And what I'm trying to, to, to reconcile in my mind is, is simply just allocating the time aside to do exercise. It sounds like that is going to, to have some effect on these processes. But is there a difference between, say, doing that and doing exercise that where there is a greater sort of cognitive challenge at the same time. So let's say, for example, I get up every morning, I go for a brisk walk. Person A does the brisk walk in the exact same route every time. Person B changes it and is, is walking for the same duration and the same intensity, but is mixing it up, is in you know unknown streets and environments, and it's a little bit more challenging in terms of working their way back home. Do you think there's going to be a difference there with regards to the, the sort of effect of that exercise intervention, quote unquote intervention, and um, how it affects their cognition? That's a great question. Uh, yes, there is evidence that when people add on a task on top of something that is innately mundane, such as walking or running, they tend to see its benefit, uh, cognitively speaking. Uh, there have been research done on um, multi-component exercises or dual tasks, which means a task that involves physical activity and then an added cognitive activity on top of it, whether it's switching your route or whether it's an actual cognitive activity, like, for example, uh, you know, saying a particular sentence or trying to memorize something or singing a song or at least, you know, keeping the rhythm with a song, anything like that, oh. that challenges the mind seems to exponentially improve cognition, specifically memory. The one area of the brain that gets affected by dual task um, activities 
is the hippocampus. Um, and the theories are obviously because of better blood flow, not just because of exercise, but because of the thought process itself. There's better blood flow to the hippocampus and it essentially grows and you see the change in the outcome and cognitive scores as well. So if people can add a variation to their exercise, say for example, or for example, they if they um, engage in an activity that has multiple different steps that are repeated over and over again, you know, for example, uh, mixed martial arts, or for example, aerobic activity that has particular types of steps that you have to memorize, or even dancing. Yes, we were trying salsa the other day. Man, it's hard on the brain. Mm -hmm. Um, those kind of activities do make a huge difference. And uh, like I said earlier, the beneficial effects are exponential. Mm -hmm. So trying new things then with regards to movement could be a good idea to sort of keep the body guessing and, and to, to kind of challenge the, the body with new things that, that require um, different levels of focus and different motor skills and et cetera. Um, you mentioned the word grow, Aisha, and, and I want to speak to you about neurogenesis, but I think this is, this is fascinating, the fact that you, you can actually grow neurons, develop new neurons, and um, often we think about growth with regards to exercise and muscle and building muscle tissue. So this is a similar concept. And where I'm going with this is uh, I think most of us recognize that let's say, for example, you get to your 30s and you don't do any exercise, that by the time you get to your 50s, you will have lost more muscle tissue than you otherwise would have if you were doing some resistance training and you had that sort of paired with good nutrition, et cetera. My question to you is let's say that someone listening is in their early 50s and they were active as a kid, you know, doing lots of school sport and sport on the weekends. Um, but then they got to their, their you know, late 20s, 30s, 40s, and life got busier. They, they had children, they were working, and um, their physical exercise sort of took, took a back seat. Mm -hmm. would, would, would you see any type of brain atrophy or shrinking as a result of that? And can you reverse that? So in your 50s, if you decide to really to, to take up an exercise regime, is there a capacity to restore some of that um, brain function and actually grow neurons at that stage in your life? The short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, so as far as neurogenesis or creation of neurons are concerned, there is evidence that we do um, have neurogenesis that occurs throughout our life um, that is propagated with two different types of activities if I had to categorize them with physical exercise and with cognitive activity. But the number of neurons that are generated in an adult is not as important as the connections that are created between the pre-existing cells. Mm -hmm. um, and the boost in cognitive function that we see due to exercise and cognitive activity is not because of neurogenesis. It's mostly because of that cognitive reserve or the neuroplasticity that takes place. And neuroplasticity is a term that is used for creation of these connections between cells. Um, and the numbers are incredible. They're crazy. So, you know, each neuron, we have 87 billion neurons after the process of you know, the program cell death during childhood, we're left with 87 billion neurons. And these neurons each can make as little as two connections or as many as 30,000 connections. So you just do the math of how exponential that, that volume is. These connections are made and broken at any moment during our life, during adult life. And there's no particular instance unless somebody is left with you know a huge brain injury where you know part of the brain is completely gone that process of neuroplasticity keeps on you know happening as we age um, and we have studies that show that when people engage in physical activities or like let's go with the example of what you said you know people who are not even engaging in physical activity, if they maintain a cognitively active life, they continue to make those 
uh, those, those connections. And the connections are translated in the thickness of the cortex, of the gray matter, and they've done studies, imaging studies of MRI, seeing that people who actually have active lives, they actually have thicker gray matter. The volume of the hippocampus, which are the parts of the brain that, um, that basically process memory, they grow as well. So yes, this, this continues to happen throughout our life, and it's, it's phenomenal to see that. Mm-hmm. Okay. And if we don't do any exercise, what happens to the brain? Do we, uh, have we kind of looked under the hood of someone who's had a, a, a life of living a, a sedentary kind of lifestyle? If a sedentary lifestyle can definitely be one of the main um, reasons for brain shrinkage. Um, right. we've, uh, just like you gave an example of how, you know, muscles grow, uh, during an active, physically active lifestyle, but then they atrophy when somebody's sedentary, um, same thing happens in the brain. Obviously there are some other factors that maintain neuroplasticity as well, but physical activity is an enormous, uh, boost for creation of those connections. Right. Um, and it's because of the release of very important growth factors during physical activity, like brain-derived neurotrophic factor, that essentially promotes the growth mm-hmm. of the connections between the cells mm-hmm. and also better blood flow to the brain, provide, right. providing more oxygen, etc. Um, and you know there have been multiple studies that have looked at um, you know individuals who are prone for having cognitive impairment and brain atrophy. Mild cognitive impairment is a stage, it's a pre-dementia stage where there is profound atrophy of the brain and there is um, abnormalities in specific domains of cognition, uh, primarily memory. And when patients with MCI were subjected to a regimented exercise program, specifically strength training, over time, over six months, they literally grew their brain, their hippocampus enlarged, wow. their neurocognitive scores improved. As a matter of fact, in one study, they showed that about 47% of them were able to reverse their diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment and get back to normal as, again. Gosh, what was the, the prescription there? What kind of dose of, of resistance training was that once a week, twice a week, three times a week? Yes, for this particular study, um, they were exposed to three days of um, strength training, and that mm-hmm. included things like leg press and seated rows and mostly core exercises and leg exercises. And when they did some factor analysis, leg exercises seemed to do, you know, to, to give most benefit as far as cognition is concerned. And they, they essentially followed that for six months. And at the end of the six months, they did neuroimaging and neurocognitive um, analysis and the results I I mentioned earlier. The fun thing about this particular study was that even six months, oh, actually, even 18 months later, without continuation of that regimented exercise activity, people tended to benefit from it, which means that Mm -hmm. their scores actually remained high. And their brain function was mm. was incredibly, um, you know, improved, which says a lot about that response after a very regimented bout of exercise that it lingers for months to years. And, and just not, just to remind, this is not just nor- individuals who, who normal individuals, not young people. These were pre Alzheimer's patients, right? MCI. Right. Yeah. 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 So that was my question. Remind us of the types of things from a cognitive perspective that someone with MCI might be having difficulty with. And so I'm sort of interested in what does this look like in, in real life? Someone right. has MCI, they're, they're, they're struggling with you know, ABC and through the adoption of a, a resistance training program, you know, what are the types of things that they might see improvement in? I think there might be people listening that um, either have MCI themselves or their parents do and and would be interested in kind of somehow trying to quantify or better objectively understand what benefits are up for grabs here. So there are a couple of different types of MCIs and, and there's one type which is called amnestic MCI, mm-hmm. which is a memory predominant, uh, the problem, people who have memory significant short-term memory problems. And a lot of men, 
who have this come to me and say, that's Sherza, I'm fine. I can remember 50 years back. It's just the breakfast that I have some difficulty remembering. Well, that's the problem. That's when your short-term memory is disproportionately affected compared to long-term memory, then that's, that's a problem. So we really have to think about um, the amnestic MCI because that's usually a pre-Alzheimer's type. And now, just because you have short-term memory problem doesn't mean you are at risk for Alzheimer's. It's got to be a little more than that. Your short-term memory is affected more than expected for your age, a little more than expected compared to others uh, uh, in your age group. Uh, but you're still able to do your daily activities. That's amnestic. Multi-domain MCI means people that who have attention problems, memory problems, a lot of times attention uh, as well as executive function, multiple domains. They're usually not Alzheimer's type, they're vascular type and other types. Why does that matter? Because the course matters, the, 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 the process matters. And so I wanna make sure people don't get scared just because they're having short-term memory doesn't mean they have MCI. Mm -hmm. They have to get checked out. If it's a little more than usual, that for age or for themselves, then that's MCI, it puts them at risk. Now MCI or mild cognitive impairment, not all of them develop Alzheimer's, but every year from the time of diagnosis, the, the risk doubles from 10% to 20% to 30%. So your risk is pretty high, but even in this group, even later in life, nearly 50% never developed the, the dementia. Mm -hmm. And the good thing about this population is you can identify them, you can see their risk factors, and for a great majority, you can reverse the risk by right. things like exercise, a significant exercise regimen. Now, a lot of times, Aisha and I have patients who come to us, oh, Dr. Sherzam, I'm fine. I do, you know, gardening and I do, I walk the neighborhood. I said, that's time. all we the time. We hear that all the time. I say, that's great, but that's meditation more than exercise. It's movement, it's good, but in order to truly push the brain, you have to do a little more than that. There is a minimum quantity that's been assessed and, and that, that people have to be involved in to truly reduce the risk of, of, of dementias. Right. How do you like to explain to someone, if someone says, okay, um, I'm interested in, in doing some, some legitimate exercise, some um, dedicated exercise, then how do you explain to them um, you know, a simple way of kind of differentiating between um, meditation style exercise and something that is actually benefiting their cognition? Is it um, their heart rate or is it sweat or is it whether they can talk to someone? What are the, the kind of things you would talk to them about? Yeah, we, we, we simplify it as much as we can. Um, we don't talk about VO2 max or calculation of your heart rate and calculation of your BMI, things like that don't really work, especially when you have such short period of time and motivate people to exercise. We basically tell them, this is what I tell them, so I'll just speak for myself. Absolutely. I say, you know, you have to break a sweat and you shouldn't be able to finish a sentence without taking a deep breath. That's, mm. that's good exercise for you. So if, you, if you're able to do that and if you feel that way, just know that your body is getting flushed with growth factors and your brain is getting a lot of oxygen and you're in that zone. So see if you can maintain that for about at least 20 minutes a day, at least three or four times a week. That's basically right. my way of saying, what do you say, Dean? Yeah, no, same thing. I've heard you say it and I loved what you said. So I stole your line. <laughs> so I, I steal Aisha's lines. Well, I said, uh, that probably was but, your line. But, but that's exactly right. I mean, they, you know, uh, you got to break a sweat. You got to get shorter breath and, and 20 to 30 minutes, four to five times a week. Uh, you know, we can start with three to four times, but four to f at least five times a week is what they've done. The studies say 150 minutes, but there's nothing magical about 150 minutes. As it happens in a study, you have to pick a number. So they've picked 150 and that seems to be the one that shows benefit. Mm -hmm. But you can, that's the, that's the lower limit that you should work your way up. But here's the thing, again, the community component, the human component, the individual component, we have to start people where they can actually succeed. Mm -hmm. If it's five minutes, because we're more worried about habit than the behavior. So if it's five minutes a day that you can actually move and, and get tired for a while, do that. Until that becomes habit, then make it six minutes and then make it seven minutes. So it's about getting the behavior done for that person. And even the exercise, we don't tell people to go to the gym. It, you know, what, what can you do in your, what did you used to do? Did you used to like biking? 
Well, I do, but I don't, you know, it's not a good neighborhood. Well, how about a stationary bike? Well, I don't have the money. Well, how about a foot pedal exerciser? Well, I don't even have, well, how about while watching the news, getting up and doing steps? And so as minimal as possible, but doable. Mm -hmm. And then checking it off. That's where the dopamine comes off, comes, comes up, where you check the activity off. That means that you actually did it. You have a sense of success. You have a measure of success. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's the key elements are breaking a sweat, feeling short of breath, but more importantly, being able to do that thing repeatedly. That's the key. And how do you think about the kind of different modalities, I guess, of exercise? Like we've spoken about aerobic, we spoke about anaerobic, we spoke about resistance training. So when you say, you know, do the, try and three to five times a week, you've got 20 minutes, that's kind of a goal it's not going to be where everyone starts but it would be great to get there um how do you think ab about the the different kinds of, of exercise within or across that week is that something that you would speak to people about what we were talking about there was aerobic or the the you know the kind of exercise okay. that gets you short of breath the running the biking the you know the swimming whatever that that might be or step stepping in place the the weight bearing exercises weight training exercises mm -hmm. separate yeah. you know you start that three to four times a week and, and increase it and we focus on legs quite a bit although upper extremity is important because a lot of injuries happen as you get older myself um I, I, well, well i was doing some crazy things but uh injured the shoulder but but the key is leg strength leg strength is incredibly important it's profoundly important number one reason for head traumas falls why? Mm. Leg strength or lack thereof. Number one reason for hospitalizations, falls, leg strength or lack thereof. Uh, balance issues, um, uh, blood flow to the brain, Great. blood clots. I mean, the list goes on and on and on how important leg strength is. And as you've heard from our previous talks, um, leg strength appears to be related to brain strength. People who have bigger legs in studies and when, even when they did prospective studies, People who built their leg strength also built brain volume, which was very counterintuitive to me, or not counterintuitive, but kind of weird. Why would leg strength be lead? But that's how important it is. Blood flow increases. Um, uh, angiogenesis increases, which means blood vessels growing. BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is this incredible growth factor. Nothing increases BDNF more than leg strength. I think it has to be because of the direct correlation between muscle mass and legs. Yes. And the creation or the volume mm. of BDNF creation, therefore mm. boosting better brain health. Absolutely. Yeah, maybe we, we dive into that a little bit more. Why is building muscle important to protecting the brain? I know, I know you've, you've shared some notes with me on that, but there are some interesting kind of mechanisms there. Well, uh, let's just talk about metabolism. I mean, the biggest m medium or vector or space of metabolism is the muscle, right? Yeah, your legs are the biggest muscles and that's where metabolism takes place. That's where gl glycogen is stored. That's where fat is stored in, in your GI and your uh, mid core section and in your lower extremities and for the most part. And, and so if you're going to exercise those muscles, they're going to affect the metabolism within themselves, obviously, and even in the periphery, in the proximity. It, nothing affects metabolism more than exercise, especially muscle exercises, even muscle building. It affects it that way. Um, and also, as we said, clearance. Your, your clearance system, be it vascular or lymphatic, operates solely because of your muscles. Your muscles are the pumps that push the lymphatic system. Your muscles are the pumps that push the blood vessels, the veins, particularly arteries have vein, uh, arteries have muscles, but veins don't, especially in legs. The, the leg muscles push them. They have one directional valves, blood gets caught, and then you push it up, up, and it goes through the vena cava into your heart and then to your lungs. It works at that level. It works at the level of clearance, waste elimination. When we exercise, lactic acid builds up and all these other waste products build up. Well, guess what? When you exercise, the blood flow gets increased, the lymphatic flow increases, and you eliminate waste. So at every level, exercise affects blood flow. It affects your nervous system. It affects metabolism. It affects waste disposal. Is there a better system 
for mm-hmm. for maintaining body's me- mechanisms of metabolism and blood flow and waste than exercise. Not 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 that I can think of. Especially legs, Absolutely. especially lower extremities. So for the direct relationship between lean body mass and brain health, the the relationship has been through BDNF and cerebral blood flow due to muscle mass, especially right. in the lower extremity. Beyond that, uh, you know, we're th- it, it's extrapolation of of the data, um, and we're learning more and more about the specific association between lean body mass and muscle building mm-hmm. and brain health in general. You mentioned VO2 max before, and that's often used as a uh, sort of measure of cardiorespiratory fitness. Mm-hmm. Is there a relationship between that and and brain health? So as, as someone's VO2 max um, goes up, do we see less cognitive decline? And I'd be really interested to know, and I don't know if anyone's ever done this, but has anyone looked at an elderly population of endurance athletes with a great VO2 max and and looked at um, their incidence of sort of MCI or, or Alzheimer's dementia later in life? That would be a neat study, wouldn't it? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think that has been done uh, as of yet. So VO2 max being a validated measure of oxygen capacity has been studied in relation to brain volume. And it looks like when people have high VO2 max or that capacity, what happens is their brain blood vessels, they change specifically very quickly and they, they don't cause any impediment to blood flow. So when people have an athletic body or they're used to exercising on a regular basis, their brain blood vessels welcome oxygenation rather quickly compared to those who have a sedentary lifestyle. And as far as brain morphology is concerned, there is an increased volume of gray matter in people who have high VO2 max. Now, it would be super interesting to actually see how a group of athletics you know, individuals with high VO2 max do as far as their cognition is concerned compared to those who don't have it. That that Mm -hmm. hasn't been really studied yet. Uh, But on the other side, flip side of it, people who have low VO2 and Mm -hmm. and, and, and like COPDers and and, and we're talking about not just athletic, but the other side, the pathology side, there's many studies that have shown that they have poor cognition. They have significant smaller brains, uh, be it because of COPD or uh, untreated sleep apnea and other things where the the VO2 is actually on the lower side on a consistent basis. Yeah, Yeah. that's true. On the pathological side, you actually tend to see white matter disease as well, which is inflammatory changes to the tiny, small little blood vessels that oxygenate the brain. So that's the pathological side of it too. Yes. Right. And and for folks that are sort of interested or listening and thinking, how do I increase my VO2 max? That goes back to that moderate to or even to high intensity exercise through your life is going to be a, a way to improve cardiorespiratory fitness and, and VO2 max. Um, is there t- such a thing as too much exercise when it comes to, to brain health or is there any kind of exercise that you would say is potentially bad for brain health? So there, there appears to be some evidence that there is, a, there is a threshold. I mean, uh, although this is being studied further, and and I, I'm I'm a little um, reluctant to kind of speak to this because it's very fairly new data as far as the upper limit of normal. There are people making statements that there is an upper limit of normal, and and intuitively it makes sense that there would be an upper limit of normal, not just a damage to the muscles and ligaments and all of that, but but even to the brain. So. We will have to see how that really pans out. But as far as the type of exercise, absolutely. Anything that traumatizes the brain is bad. Anything that um, uh, uh, causes concussions are bad. And we know this from uh, sports uh, where there is uh, um, high impact, like like boxing. You have, you know, uh, uh, Parkinson's pugilistica, which means Parkinson's that comes about as a result of boxing. I mean, we, mm. we correlate it strongly. And we know that a lot of boxers that have been hit many times in the head, they, they have a higher likelihood of developing Parkinson's. And, and, and we know that people who have a traumatic brain injury to the head repeatedly have concussions and, and, and then dementias and, and encephalopathies. We know the, the, this from the football studies and things of that nature, although that still needs to be clarified further. So there's a plenty of evidence, be it indirect, 
that traumatic, repeated traumatic events to the brain have negative effects. There was even recently a, a big push about things like soccer. I mean, I played soccer and, um, and, and heading the ball repetitively was a great worry. Although they did a several meta analyses and they said, okay, there's not very little risk. We still should be aware of it for our kids. I'm kind of worried about, about that phenomenon because I, I think that when kids, especially young kids hit their head, you know, do many headers, especially high velocity headers, that's got to be damaging to the brain. Let me show you the, the, the just structurally how tenuous the brain is. We have props, of course. Yeah. Props. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is props and, 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 and also uh, plenty of whiteboards around your house. Yes, whiteboards. The inside of the so this brain, this actually is a hard brain. The real brain is gelatinous. We're talking about it's soft. You could actually push your finger through it. It's that, that's how soft it is. What's important mm -hmm. is to note the um, the bony structure of the skull that right. holds that gelatinous structure. Right. You know, there's actually these shards of bones that hold the brain in inside. And when there is micro traumas, say, for example, with high impact sports or with punches or with headers, it actually um, causes contusion to the brain. And over time, that could become a problem. In fact, uh, the, the fluid that, that surrounds the brain, people think that it's protective. It's not. It's, it's not viscous. It's actually like water. So it doesn't provide any significant protection. Um, and, and especially when a child is young and the brain is even softer or smaller, the movement can cause significant, or when somebody's very old. That's why when people are very old, when they fall with a small little head trauma, the brain has shrunk, the brain moves more because there's more space, and the bridge and bridging veins collapse or get tear, torn and they get bleeding in the brain. So we worry about a lot of activities that cause these, what we call micro traumas. Micro traumas we think has consequences. The data is there. The data is still being elucidated, better clarified. Um, although they said that things like headers might not be dangerous for adults, I would be very worried for children mm -hmm. um, because of the very structure of the brain. Our brains were not intended to live to 70 to 80 to 90 years, 30 years, 40 years. You know, you're past the age of reproduction. That's good enough for, for, for evolution. And therefore, it, whatever happened after or before, you had enough resilience not to see the effect until you have your mm -hmm. children. But for us who want to live healthy and brain healthy well into our 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s and beyond, we really have to look at it differently. We have to think about the long game, which evolution didn't care about. We really have to game the system and not allow the micro traumas that might not affect the average 30 year old, but will affect an average 70 or 80 year old. So that's where what, what your question, which is what kind of activities do I think I would avoid? Data driven? Yes. Football and, and, and especially American football where people are hitting each other that there's Plenty of data that that could have a effect long term. Um, boxing, especially people who get hit a lot if they're not good boxers or, or things of that nature. But people should be worried a little bit of even micro traumas and see in your own life where that micro trauma might over time, maybe in your 60s or 70s, might have a consequence. Yeah, and probably some of those other extreme sports like the you know the jet skiing and some of those guys come off those at at pretty high speeds hitting the water um i'm interested in what the difference is between say the micro trauma that you're talking about and and a full-blown concussion so often you know we hear about concussions over here in australia the the sort of um, major football code is afl and there's quite frequently concussions but i'd say over the last five years there's been a lot more attention media and medical talk about managing these concussions to the point now where when there is thought to be even just a likely concussion that player has to come off they have to be medically assessed 
they have to, if they if they believe there was even the chance of a concussion, they have to spend at least 20 minutes first sitting down to, to be fully assessed. Um, if there was a, a significant con- concussion, they're out for the game, they're yeah. out for the next week as well. So there's this real um, emphasis on allowing time for rest and recovery now if someone is thought to have had a concussion, which is very different to say 10, 20 years ago, if someone had a concussion, they might come off, be reassessed, but they just go straight back out and continue playing. Um, so I'm kind of interested in just what your thoughts are about like a, a full-blown concussion and, and why why is that such a bad thing for our brain compared yeah. to say a micro trauma? Yeah. So concussion by definition, there, there are now definitions for what concussion is altered mental state and and um uh, where a person is uh, not not you know uh, feeling dizzy and and uh, they've had a head trauma it could be a open injury or a closed injury and all of that stuff so and there are studies actually that show that people who've had multiple concussions actually have a higher risk of dementia and and by definition it's been shown that when you had concussions and several of them, their risk of dementia increases. So that's why it's, it's, it's significant. It's important. And it's not even about dementia. Yeah. If we have, if we've studied dementia, imagine what, what it's doing as far as cognition in general. So for a general yeah. population, because it's actually fairly common. Uh, concussions are fairly common. So the degree of concussion matters. The, the duration, the intensity matters. And they've shown that when the concussion was major concussion and if it was an open concussion where the, the brain was uh, uh, structurally damaged and has more effect and so on and so forth. And so that, that really matters. And so what the precautions we've taken on, we think it's, it's a good first step, but I think that we really are not taking them very seriously as a population as, as, because there are, uh, there are overriding interests, whereas we love sports. So, we want to make sure that those continue and they should continue. I love sports, all sports. But at the same time, <clears throat> it's almost like that game where if you bring up something, it makes you uncomfortable, so you close your eyes to it. We're literally doing that as a society. Concussions are way more common than they should be, and they're avoidable, yet we're avoiding the conversations because of these paraphenomenon of sports and everything else. Okay. Mm-hmm. And and the long-term consequences are there. Dementia is one of them. And emotional issues, depression, anxiety in children and young children who've had concussions, attention deficit, all of these have been associated with, with, with concussions. And, and, and if I may add, yeah. the, the reason why AFL and the American Sports Federation and some other countries have come to a consensus and have created specific guidelines for adults and kids to sit out of a game after concussion is because even a slight injury without having very you know obvious injuries to the head or to the brain could potentially lead to a lot of abnormalities and we're grateful for some of the imaging studies that have been done that actually show that even if there is no visible injury to the skull or to the brain there's a lot of exonal damage which means shearing injuries to the connections between the brain cells that occur and that leads to a lot of inflammation and that shearing damage and the inflammation can lead to memory problems mm-hmm. dizziness anxiety, nausea, vomiting, and some, you know, a slew of different symptoms. And a lot of individuals end up having an invisible syndrome of a sort where on the outside, they seem absolutely fine, but they can't really function very well because of the, you know, cognitive impairment of the damage that they're left with. So it's a very serious issues. And I'm happy that a lot of countries are coming up with guidelines to make sure that people take it seriously. Uh, beautifully stated. I mean, uh, some of the things that happen uh, uh, we have uh, with these brains is d- direct trauma to the tissue. The head is hit, the skull is damaged, and then tissue is damaged. But the majority of the damage is what I should describe, which is shearing uh, uh, forces to the white matter, which is the connections between neurons. Uh, this is the cortex, the outer su- uh, element of the brain. But between the different parts of the brain are the connections these highways of connections. And when the brain moves, those parts are actually sheared or damaged. There are now, in the past, we didn't have the tools to look at them, but now we have tools like DTI and, and other uh, uh, tools that can look at the shearing and the damage and those uh, connections in between neurons. And those damaged 
connections can be affected, can be treated. But if you had just had an acute trauma, you just had a contusion or concussion, mm -hmm. and then you had another one the next day or the next week that significantly increases damage because the inflammation adds up exponentially. The damage adds up exponentially. That's why they try to avoid, uh, you know, keeping a person off a, um, uh, off the field if they had a concussion, or keeping them off the game for a couple of days. But uh, but we're still at the very beginning stages of truly understanding trauma to the brain, traumatic brain injury, or even these micro traumas, which I'm very interested in uh, mm -hmm. us addressing. Yeah, that makes sense. So the rest is really really important. Then, if you think you've had some trauma so that you don't have a compounding effect and that any damage done to those connections actually has sufficient time and space to, to recover. Um, something that we didn't talk about earlier was um, we spoke about the, the benefit of resistance exercise for someone that has MCI. But I'm, I'm curious... Um, as to the effectiveness of exercise for someone that has Alzheimer's dementia. So they've progressed, they have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia or even say vascular dementia or someone that's had a stroke. And I know that these are all different conditions, but where I'm getting at is once there is significant pathology in the brain, mm -hmm. Does exercise, is there, is there the capacity for exercise to actually, in these instances, improve cognition by increasing BDNF or through angiogenesis, some of these mechanisms that we've spoken about? Yes, yes. <clears throat> there was a study, uh, a systematic uh, um, review and a meta-analysis that was published a couple of years ago looking at the effect of uh, um, exercise, multimodal exercise on patients with Alzheimer's disease, mild, moderate uh, Alzheimer's disease. And it showed that um, depending on multiple different factors that the participants had, you know, whether they were uh, cognitively active or not, these, that, there were some confounding effects, but in general, aerobic exercise as well as strength training in the combination thereof improved their cognition. And it also slowed down the process of the disease in a way where the neurodegenerative component actually almost stalled and slowed down significantly, which is a phenomenal news mm -hmm. if patients with Alzheimer's disease can engage in some level of exercise they can significantly slow down the progression of the disease. And it makes sense. Better uh, blood flow to the brain, uh, better me metabolic uh, shifts so that glucose is used better by the cells, mm -hmm. improvement in insulin resistance, which could potentially be a component in Alzheimer's disease. Um, also, the brain-derived neurotrophic factors increasing the connections between neurons. So from multiple directions, there's actually an improvement in brain health in general. And when they looked at neurocognitive scoring systems, they actually had improvement in some aspects of their cognition, not all of them. Specifically, attention and processing improved, not memory in wow. Alzheimer's disease cases. R remind me, uh, has, that, has that ever been shown for nutrition interventions in, in, in a population of people with Alzheimer's or is this unique to exercise? No, they have actually looked at the Mediterranean diet and Mediterranean diet in Alzheimer's disease patients. And specifically in the Northern Manhattan study, they did a study um, in, I believe it was early in the 2000s when patients with Alzheimer's disease consumed a Mediterranean-like diet. These were American patients who ate a Mediterranean pattern diet, obviously depending on the scoring system. So increased amounts of poly and monounsaturated fats, increased amount of fiber from fresh fruits and vegetables and whole grains, um, lowering saturated fats that are derived from animal products. They all led to improvement and also slowing down of the progression of the disease. More than the improvement part, the slope of decline actually kind of flattened out in people eating a Mediterranean diet. So yes, it has been seen in diet too. And, and I'm, I'm diving into your realm, stroke My and realm? vascular oh, diseases yeah. 
right. are profoundly yes. affected oh. at every stage by exercise um, um, significantly. So when it comes to stroke and all the spectrum of vascular disease, which is fairly universal as we get older, right? Nothing affects that more than than um, exercise. Um, whether it's a massive stroke where a person is left paralyzed on one side, where they start improving, or even minor strokes, they improve significantly. One aspect of, of brain health that we haven't spoken too much about during this conversation is uh, mood disorders like anxiety and depression. Are there are there any studies that you know of that that have looked specifically? I mean, we have spoken about runners high, and we've spoken about um, dopamine and, and whatnot. But are there any studies that have looked at um, exercise and how it can affect mood disorders? Uh, the, the, when it comes to anxiety and depression, there are many studies that have shown that exercise po- profoundly and positively affects uh, both of those, and and short and long term. Um, and 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 the analogy I give is that. You know, dopamine, especially small little bursts of dopamine, are these little tugboats that push the direction of mood. And, you know, you keep repeating, keep succeeding, keep reaching a goal, especially with movement. These are these tugboats that direct movement, direct mm-hmm. emotional patterns. And then over time, they turn the ship of emotion, which is serotonin. The ship of emotion, which turns very slowly, is affected by these little tugs of movement, which nothing affects that better than exercise. When you succeed in behavior of of exercise on a regular basis, and success is actually completing your regimen, be it a five minute walk, 10 minute walk, which you said, plus that endorphins, plus that, you know, that heart beating fast and then being relieved. All of that is actually creating these movements that shifts the ship, the, 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 the ocean liner of emotion towards positive. And that the, the one thing that affects mood long-term, the serotonin background, the main emotional, the, 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 as I use the analogy of the, of the big um, ocean liner, is exercise and consistent and repeated exercise. Nothing affects it better than, than, than exercise. Guys, this has been um, wonderfully insightful. I think we, we kind of wrap this up on a practical note and, and earlier we, we mentioned uh, motivation and I, I, I mentioned that Dean has spoken to me several times at dinner about motivation versus discipline. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you can kind of share your thoughts on, on this and any tips that you have for listeners who, who maybe are thinking this is amazing information. I, I really do want to benefit from this. I'd, I'd love to add more exercise to my lifestyle, not just for my health, but now also uh, for my brain. But perhaps they're they're doubting their ability to to sort of integrate it into their life as a, a long term practice. What what words of advice would you have for them? You want you want me to start? Uh, so my my main thing is we actually start our program with exercise because it's the easiest, most tangible thing to affect. Sleep is difficult. Sleep we work. It's a long program, six month program, and it's extremely important. It's the main cleansing, but it takes time. <clears throat> Food is a little difficult. Just getting rid of sugar is as a as a beast. Getting rid of saturated fat is incredibly difficult. Exercise is well circumscribed, well defined. And the reward is so rapid. So, but we don't focus on exercise. We see, we say, what can you do regularly? And without, if, if worse comes to worse, if everything is gone, what can you do? Is it a biking exercise? Is it swimming? If you have a swimming pool or nothing, all you have is the steps in your room in your space. Then, then you do that and you work towards habit. 10 minutes, start with 10 minutes of stepping in place or walking in the neighborhood because you're trying to develop the habit. Once you develop the habit and you check it off on a piece of paper, by the way, add that check off, that check off is the reward. Mm -hmm. That creates a habit. Then you push yourself in that 10 minutes to get tired. After a month of doing that 10 Mm -hmm. minutes, now you push yourself to get tired in that 10 minutes. Then after a month, you move it to 12 minutes and then slowly you move it up. That regimen is so powerful. That's the aerobic component. The anaerobic, if you don't have knee problems, if you don't have hip problems, a mini squat, we started this with my mother-in-law this last week. We should have started earlier, but 
as you know, both Aisha and I have a very strong history, family history of dementia. Her grandmother and grandfather had uh, dementia early on and mine as well. So we are fighting this for ourselves for, and, and her mom, uh, uh, you know, a high risk at multiple levels. The food has helped significantly. Absolutely. She's 75 and see she's sharp. And I, we completely, 78. 78, completely attributed to plant-based diet uh, because this is a, everybody else in their family at that age has gotten the disease. So she's sharp, but the exercise component, she walks the neighborhood, but we added leg strength, which is mini squats, holding onto a counter and going down 60 degrees, not all the way, not 45 and up. And she's so motivated. She does 20 of those in the morning, 20 at night. So do things that are doable, repeatable, habit forming, and check them off. That creates the dopamine surge, success. It makes you feel sick. And it creates that blood flow, leg strength, aerobic as well. I think there's nothing better to start with, with those two things. Absolutely. The, the aerobic exercise, whatever that is for you, you know, the walk, the biking, or just stepping in place, and then the leg strength, and it's just mini squats or lunges. And you have really started your way incredibly positively uh, towards a better brain. It's, it's one of those things that you see an immediate effect and also a long-term effect. The immediate effect of exercise is quite palpable. And a lot of people that we work with in the community, they do say that they feel sharper, that they actually have more energy. And I think that's one of the reasons why everybody recommends exercise first thing in the morning, because it sets the tone for the rest of the day with that increased blood flow to the brain, with the increased production of endorphins and the brain-derived neurotrophic factor. You get this boost of energy that makes you do better and better in every aspect of your life during the day. And Dane, just on that list and, and checking it off, um, talk to me about, you know, if someone is still, you know, that, that catchphrase line of, I just can't get motivated. I just don't have the motivation. Talk to me specifically about motivation versus discipline and what that sort of take home message on that is. And I know you could talk on this probably for a couple of hours. So motivation is not a thing. The breakdown product of motivation is achievement toward the direction. So you set your direction and make it a measurable achievement. So motivation for exercise is, I'm going to walk for five minutes a day and then check it off. That becomes its own mechanism. That doesn't have to rely on, on an amorphous, weird emotion that it has, to, it has to be there all the time. Nobody has motivation intrinsically in them all the time. But if you take it away from a weird, amorphous definition and make it functional, motivation with exercise means I'm going to do five minutes of walking and then I'm going to check it off. And after multiple iterations of that, that becomes an emotion that you have control over. Motivation with food means I'm going to eat two servings of greens, the positive side, not, uh, not elimination, but addition. Two servings of greens a day and I'm going to check it off. That becomes after several iterations, that becomes a motivation that you have control over with regards to food. With, with mental activity, I'm going to play this particular game of memory half an hour a day, and I'm going to check it off. Then you don't rely on motivation for pushing your brain, but you have a mechanism that actually brings about motivation because you have control over it. It becomes so empowering that you don't leave it to some meaningless word, a word with no denominator, but you create your own structure, your own denominator, and take complete control over that word. Thank you so much, team. As always, this has been uh, very, very informative. Um, keep doing what you're doing. You're making a huge difference out there. I absolutely love what you guys are are constantly sharing and all the work you're doing. And uh, I know you're up to a, a number of other interesting things at the moment. So perhaps in the future, we can get you back on and you can tell us all about that. Um, as a reminder for, for folks that are listening, um, Dean and Aisha have two books, um, both incredible and their latest one, the 30-Day Alzheimer's Solution, which is a great book for anyone, not just those with cognitive decline. So um, highly recommend that if you're looking for a new book. And on Instagram, you have a new a new uh, username now, right? Yes, we are the Brain Docs. <laughs> okay, so at the Brain Docs, um, go and check them out. Okay, guys, I look forward to uh, hopefully catching up with you in LA soon. 
um, and the kids and, and uh, getting a chance to meet Hope. Can't wait to see you. Thank Absolutely. you so much for Thank having you. us, Emma. This was fun, like always. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science-based conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive. If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format. Yes, the full length videos. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app, wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a review on Apple or Spotify. Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show, or questions that you'd like to have answered, please leave those in the comments section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take note of these comments when planning future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.